This is an exciting topic. Um, as you'll see, in 2003, we published the very first paper on spatial temporal image correlation, STIC, new technology for evaluation of the fetal heart. And uh, Peter Falkensheimer, who is also a physician, participated with us on this, pro on this paper, as well, doc as well as Dr. Mark Skolansky, a pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Larry Platt. The time that STIC was introduced, we were excited about the fact that we could see three planes simultaneously on the screen. However, one of the problems happened to be that sometimes the fetus didn't stay, stand still. In fact, many times it didn't, and we would see artifact on the display. Having that limitation, however, did not stop investigators. I'll, make, I'll come back to that in a second. Let me explain how the technology works. With the mechanical probe, this is a mechanical probe, the sweep occurs, and so the acquisition then is then processed, and we see the corresponding stick to display. Uh, now, let me just go over this. I did this with the last talk. Let me explain a couple concepts that are potential problems with current stick, te current stick technology. If one wants to improve the resolution, you have several options. One is to increase the time that the sweep goes through the angle that you've chosen. For example, you can select angles, sweeps of 30 degrees or 25 degrees or 15 degrees, whatever it may be. And that The degree simply means what distance does the sweep travel, whether it's, say, for example, it began here at the stomach and went all the way up to the four chamber view or the neck. So what would happen is if you wanted to improve the resolution, you had to increase the time. If you wanted to decrease the artifact, you had to decrease the time. Or you had to take and for the same uh, time that you chose, decrease the sweep angle. So you had to work with these two variables, distance traveled and time of acquisition. So this is what led to sometimes the, uh, the artifact that would occur. Now, having introduced stick technology in 2003, there have been over, there are, there are actually 100 publications right now, as of last week, on stick technology and the fetal heart. So, so many investigators around the world have found this this tool to be useful, have reported on a number of different uses of it, and uh, it's, been very, it's been very helpful, but again, the problem is one of artifact. This is a paper published in 2008. The authors were from uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and they found that while they examined 148 patients, they could only use a stick for analysis 49% of the time. Now that may, of course, vary. If you have enough time, you can wait for the fetus to, to cooperate and then acquire an adequate stick volume. But again, time is, a, is of the effort, a, essence. So what are the problems with the current stick technology? One, there's a movement artifact in the BNC planes, which we described. Two, there's a, there's a problem of inadequate resolution in the BNC planes. Even though you may have the fetus who's, move, who's not moving and it's perfectly still, You'll have very good resolution in the B plane, but the C plane has always been one that's been very difficult because of the technology to see really clearly, clearly a lot of detail. We're going to show you today that this has dramatically changed with this new approach. So what does the new electronic probe do? Uh, it takes and it can do several things. It can fire sequentially as it's doing here, uh, as you would see with a 4D live, real-time 4D. It can do biplanar. Uh, or it can simply act as a uh, 2D probe and image to, uh, two dimensions. So what must the electronic probe technology do to be beneficial to make volume analysis of the fetal heart more practical? These are the two principles that this probe has to address. One, it must limit or eliminate artifact in the B and C planes. Two, it must increase the resolution in the B and C planes. If this probe does not do either of those, then it's not worth any investment whatsoever from the point of view of the clinician. So we're gonna, we're gonna focus on these two principles and of course show you examples and uses of, of this newer technology. So what happens? With real-time 4D, we have a very rapid sweep, as you'll see in a moment, that uh, collects uh, data points called volumes. And so it's sweeping, as it sweeps, it collects a volume over the distance that one has chosen. E-stick does something a little bit different. Instead of before, when the, when the stick was acquiring uh, line upon line, it took a longer period of time, the E-stick technology collects sub-volumes, so it's a, big, it's a larger sampling of data, and then stitches the sub-volumes together, and I'll show you how that works in just a moment. 
So let's now look at real time 4D, what it does. So here we are. What must happen? The first thing, we must identify the four-chamber view of the heart, which we've done here. And this is a, uh, an image you can see. We set the angle of acquisition in the B plane, which I'll show you in a moment. We acquire the real-time 40 volumes from 2 to 10 seconds. And we isolate one cardiac cycle for evaluation. And remember, there's no artifact in this volume. Now, here we have, this is an image. And I'll, I'll, if we have time, I'll go and bring one up on 40 uh, view and show you what it looks like. Here's the, here's the four-chamber view and the short-axis view of the heart. Now, the problem is the longer or the wider the sweep angle, then the fewer volumes one's going to see in the overall uh, volume data set. So what we want to do is not have a large sweep angle in the B-plane. This is from the head down to the upper pelvis. And that gives you four volume frames per cardiac cycle, which is not enough for interpretation. So we want to set the angle of the acquisition as small as possible that encompasses the information that we want. And doing so here, we can see that we have 11 volume frames per cardiac cycle. Now, what's a volume frame? What a volume frame means is that for every frame, there's a complete volume data set that we have for analysis. And so 11 volume frames makes up the cardiac cycle. So in one complete cardiac cycle, there are 11 frames. Each of those frames contain a complete volume that allows you to navigate through that volume. Now, once you've acquired a sequence of volumes, you may say, well, I want to record it for five seconds or two seconds or 10 seconds. But what you have the ability to do, and this just shows you how to do this on the 4D view, but you can do it on the machine, is you simply go through, and if I have 81 volumes that are stored over this time period, I can isolate the beginning and the end of one cardiac cycle and then loop one cardiac, uh, one cardiac cycle with volumes. And this becomes helpful if you want to take and isolate it down to a single volume for a single cycle, I should say, for evaluation. Now, <clears throat> having said that, there are some other things that are adjusted in the real-time 4D. I've listed up here at the top acquisition rate, hertz. What does that mean? On the screen, you'll see, as you record, your images in 2D, for example, it may say 80 hertz <clears throat> or 120 hertz or 140 hertz. What that simply means is that at that time, the machine is acquiring 140 uh, uh, frames per second. Now, we know that the fetal heart, for example, usually has one complete cycle in about half of a second. So on, this, on the display with the real-time 4D, if we, we may see, for example, uh, the setting, it, it says it's 39 hertz, beginning, depending on how we set it up. Now, the hertz will change and become lower as we adjust what are called the resolution selections. Here we have mid-1, mid-2, high 1, high 2, max, max 1, and max 2. So each of these settings will, incre will increase the image resolution of what you're acquiring, but in doing so, it also decreases the overall volume frame rate. Here we go. It's about half, 39, 17, 14. This is for one cardiac cycle, by the way. 17 for one cycle, 14, 11, 10, 8, 6, and 4. So let's look at these images. In mid-1... The resolution is set at mid-1. My acquisition rate was 39 hertz, but for one cardiac cycle, it turned out to be 17 frame volume. So I have 17 frames in this particular volume for one cardiac cycle. Here we have a little bit higher resolution set at high 2. I have 10 frame volumes for this cardiac cycle. And here at max 2, I have 4. Now, notice how choppy this is. And so it's, you're not getting all of systole and diastole. You only have 4 frames per cycle. And so if you look at this, you say, well, the, probably the best setting is high 2 at a volume frame rate of 10 at a hertz acquisition of 26. And so this is how you would set your system up as you're examining the patient to make your adjustments. You can adjust the depth of the, of the, of the field. You can adjust the, the width of it. And also you can adjust then the resolution. And then this is the picture that you res would receive or see in the B plane. And again, the effects of, of volume frames. Here we are at 20 weeks with four volume frames per second, a, a wide angle versus a narrow one at 11 uh, volume frames per second. So this is important when you consider using the 4D and setting it up. Now, once you have a volume that you like, you also can enhance the image by using uh, VCI. Now, we set the VCI at one millimeter. Now, what is a VCI? It's basically a way of, of a system putting together two frames, one behind the other, that are a millimeter apart, and merging the information. And what it does 
it often clears up the field and makes the, the boundaries of the blood pool versus the walls much more clearly uh, identified. And you see here, for example, here's the valve, much more clearly identified than in the, in the raw image. So some people prefer VCI uh, when they look at the heart, and others do not. But this is an option that's there, of course. Here's another example. This is the original 2D image for comparison that we would obtain when we did a routine 2D image acquisition, the highest frame rate, the best resolution. This is an e-stick VCI off. You'll see there's a little bit of degradation in the image quality, but not much. In fact, it looks very, very interpretable. And uh, for uh, that, that's great. And here we see um, an e-stick volume uh, with VCI at one millimeter. Okay, now um, gestational age. We see this is a 13-week heart, and you may think we're hallucinating, but actually you can see the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the right atrium, the left atrium. This, is, of course, is with the transabdominal approach. Now, what we show you here is, in using the real-time 4D, what we have is different gestational ages, and by adjusting the settings, you see that the image quality stays pretty much the same. Here we have 20 weeks. We have 12 volume frames, and I've set it at max because I have a smaller distance that it has to travel in acquiring the volume at a, at a gestational age of 20 weeks, I can set the, the, the resolution to a higher setting and have a very nice uh, volume frame rate at 29 hertz. Here we are at 25 weeks because the fetus is a little bit larger. I simply decrease the resolution to high one. I have 27 hertz, 11 volume frames. And again, look, I think when you look at these images I'm, I'm sharing with you, look at the short axis, the B plane. Look at the, the detail in the valves as they open and close. This is something that is really important. I'll show you some other examples in the C-plane, but just when you look at that, look at the B-plane. That's the real essence of the test. Here we are at 33 weeks. We've now set it to mid-2, so it's a little bit lower resolution, but it's a bigger, bigger heart, and we still maintain 28 hertz, 11 volume frames. And here we are at 17 hertz, 8 volume frames at 35 weeks, and again, really nice detail obtained in this artifact free of movement volume acquisition. Now, some have asked, what about color Doppler or power Doppler with a, with a real-time 4D? The, the problem with that is because the volume is being a little bit lower, you can get very nice color. Look how the color boundary here is along the inner ventricular septum, the outflow track. I mean, it's very nice color. This is great um, display of color. The trouble is when the frame rate is lower, you don't get in systole or in diastole clearly identified, so you get a blurring or a merging of the two, which may be fine if you're looking at where the blood is going, but we probably would suggest that you not make the real-time 4D color your tool of choice when doing color Doppler. Okay, so that's the background on real-time 4D. What's the summary of that background I just mentioned to you? The summary is the following. You can acquire a volume of data for the heart that includes the four chamber and, and the area through the, through the chest that you need for the outflow tracks, artifact free. So that if that fetus moves, those, those B and C planes, and we'll show you, do not change. They're not altered, uh, artifact free. And that's really, really a huge step for us who do fetal echocardiography is to see those planes and not have artifact affect them. Okay, E-stick is a little bit different. E-stick is kind of interesting. It's a form of stick, but what's different about E-stick is the system, what it does, it triggers off of the heart rate from the, from the B-mode image. So it says, okay, how fast are you, is the heart beating? And it, and it can sense that. There's a magical person inside that machine that counts the heart rate. And so it says it's 120, 130 beats, whatever it may be. So once it knows that heart rate, it then says, okay, if I have a fixed heart rate or the interval between heartbeats, how big can I make my, my acquisition volume, which means it's acquiring a s data simultaneously in that area. It's, it's called a volume, a subvolume. So between here and here, once it knows what that is, it says I can make the subvolume a certain size and, and send down a, a beam of, of, uh, of uh, ultrasound beam and capture all the elements in that subvolume simultaneously with no artifact. So then what it does, it says, okay, I have a certain width of my subvolume. Now I'm going to see how many subvolumes I have to acquire to go the length of the dis or the distance that the user has chosen. Now here's the beauty of this: when you have the subvolumes determined, you can make your length as long as you want. 
I can set it up so that my sub my length begins at the toes, ends at the head, and guess what? I'll have the same resolution going down that sweep as I move because the sub volumes uh, are, are fixed and the time that it travels is, is fixed. Now, having said that, however, by setting up the type of resolution that I want, it may, if you have a low setting or a high setting for resolution, it will spend more time on that area acquiring the information. That would slow down the time that it takes to travel the distance that you want. So you're going to adjust the resolution. That would mean how long it dwells in this particular area to capture that subvolume. So once the subvolume is captured, then what it does, it identifies the heart rate, like I said, and, and it's, again, the machine computes that. It then acquires the subvolumes, and there's no limit on the distance that it travels, which is a great thing for, for looking at the heart. We want to acquire all the information from the stomach to the neck. That's not a problem because of the way that this is being done. The subvolumes are, are then compiled, and we make a single volume from which we can analyze, and there is some potential for artifact if the fetus moves a bit. And you can actually see that in this particular image. I have a lot of movement you can see over here, I did, I did this on purpose because the kid was bouncing all over the place. But I want you to see here, if you look carefully, you can actually see the lines of the subvolume right here. This purple line is the boundaries of the subvolumes going through this particular sweep. And because of the of movement artifact, they jump out at you. You can see the lines of stitching did not coalesce together. But when you do not have movement artifact, it all blends in together as one picture. So this is an extreme, but it illustrates the width of the subvolumes. I think it's important to understand what's really happening. So here we are. Let's now do some comparison. Same fetus. We have real-time 4D on your left, and we have an e-stick on your right. What you observe is a higher-resolution image with the e-stick, and we have 40 volume frames uh, in one cardiac cycle, where here we have 10 volume frames. But again, what's the advantage of the real-time 4D? I can acquire it any time and not have any artifact movement if the fetus does move. Whereas here, if the fetus doesn't move, I can acquire an image that has higher resolution and more frames per cardiac cycle. Here's, this, here's the B plane. Now look at the quality again of the B plane. Even though we're in the real time 4D, I can see the leaflets the, like a fish mouth opening of the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve. Here we have the pulmonary valve. Here's the same view with the E-stick, a little bit more clarity involved, a higher frame rate. Again, these are native images. I've not turned on VCI whatsoever. Here we are in the C plane. Now, this, to me, was the most striking. I've looked at thousands of stick volumes over the years. And I looked at the C plane. I thought, man, what a waste of space on the screen. I can't tell a darn thing from the C plane. It looks like a bunch of garbage to me because it just, the resolution was not very good. Well, look, what do we see here in this, in this fetus? The C plane, look how nicely depicted we happen to see the, the left ventricular chamber in what's called the two-vessel or the two-chamber uh, two view. I mean, I can see the boundaries, and they're clear. And I'll show you in a moment why this is important when we do some quantif quantification. Here we have the E-stick, again, even clearer boundaries of the left ventricular chamber and what's called the, the two-chamber view. So this, to me, is the real test of the, of the methodology. If I were to say, oh, can you tell the B-plane looks a little bit better? You may go, well, I don't know. It kind of looks okay to me most of the time anyway. But when we look at the C-plane, and I show you the clarity of the C-plane, that's the acid test of this technology. When you see that clarity, you know that you have really have improved it dramatically. And here we see, for example, just giving it, here's a fetus at uh, 32 weeks. We have E-stick low quality, 40 frames per second. And here we have max one. Not a whole lot of difference. I mean, you can see some subtleties in the lung tissue here in the A-plane. And here you have one little stitch right here that, that uh, the kid moved. And so you can see that stitch artifact. Basically, very nice detail. Uh, in the short axis in the B plane. And the color Doppler, uh, I would say to you that the color Doppler with the E stick is exquisite. I don't see artifact in the old stick in that way of approaching color Doppler. You'd see the color didn't quite match up with the 2D. It was kind of like lagging behind, didn't really fill properly. With this uh, E stick technology, it looks really, really great and it's, uh, it tracks just perfectly. Okay. So let's compare now the real-time 4D and the e-stick. Well, the real-time 4D, we get no artifact. And this is really important if you have a fetus that's bouncing every place. You have a little bit lower resolution. The e-stick, you have possible artifact, but I'll dare say to you that 
if the people experienced a 49% rate for being able to analyze a stick acquisition with the older technology, this rate will be much, much higher with this. And it's been our experience that I can acquire an e-stick, you know, in, 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 in seconds. And so the artifact is really, really, really dramatically reduced, and we have a higher resolution. Okay, now let's see what we can do with this. I mean, people say, well, I don't care if I don't, the kid moves. I mean, why should I take and even consider newer technology when I'm still paying for the old? Well, let me show you what, how this enhances what we do. Let's go through several areas. Volume, vocal analysis, ejection fraction using Simpson's rule, and 2D and M-mode measurements. Uh, a number of investigators from Israel and from Europe, the United States, have published their data on trying to compute the volume of the ventricles to compute stroke volume, cardiac output, and ejection fraction. And what they did is we see with the vocal, you've all done this perhaps before, where you simply take and identify a structure. Here we have a ventricle, and you trace around the chamber of the ventricle as it rotates it through different angles. Now, I don't know about you, but when I did that, I said, you know, I don't know where I am in this particular view because the resolution, it's kind of a, between a, a B and C plane resolution, and it kind of sucked. And I said, I don't know where I am. I mean, how do I know? I mean, how do I place this line to kind of compute the volume? That was the problem that, I, that we had that many people, I think, saw. Well, with a higher resolution in the 4D, real-time 4D in the E-stick, Look at the, here, this is now a complete tracing that we finished as we computed the volume. The boundaries are really crystal clear. As you rotate around that axis to make your trace, there's no more guessing of what you're seeing. There's no more guessing, wonder where I am. It's there to be seen just clear as day. So this is a real advantage. It's much more accurate in the measurements that anybody who wants to do research and they have been to acquire this new technology, you can go back and probably repeat the studies and see if the... This approach gives you much more precise information. This is also something built into all the systems, actually. It's called Simpson's uh, Rule for Evaluating Left Ventricular Volume and Ejection Fraction and Cardiac Output. And what they do, they, in the adult world, they take and find the four-chamber view, and they divide it up into little line segments like little circles or discs. And they say, okay, the left ventricle is a cylinder. By tracing it like so, it in diastole or in systole, you can compute then the volume of the left ventricle. And they also do it in the two-chamber view. But in the past, the two-chamber view, which was in the C-plane for most of us, was poorly identified. Well, you can see how nicely we see the, 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 the walls here identified. So we can have a very nice, quick, efficient way using these probe, this probe to acquire the four-chamber and the two-chamber view and trace and it's built into your system. All your, your current volume sons have this built into it under the cardiac settings to trace the Simpsons, using Simpsons rule to, to identify the volume and the uh, compute the ejection fraction for the left ventricle. Now, it doesn't work for the right ventricle because the right ventricle is not a cylinder. It's a triangular-shaped structure. That's where the vocal analysis would come in handy. Another example, just showing you another left ventricle right here that we traced out, a little bit larger print here so you can see the, how this is done. It takes just seconds to do once you have the proper alignment in the images, and your systole as well. Okay, now another exciting area that can only be done with the e-stick is this concept of an artificial, what do you call it? It's not an artificial MO, it's an MO that loops, but here's the advantage of it. We've all been, perhaps, who do fetal cardiology have been asked to make measurements of the chambers. Now, what's the problem with that? When you have a four-chamber view and you're trying to measure the diameter of the right or left ventricles, what is your problem? Trying to determine where you are in diastole if you're trying to compute the chamber dimension, right? So you, you acquire the image, you stop it, you frame it back and forth and back and forth and say, well, is this in diastole? Is this the biggest diameter? Well, with the real-time, excuse me, with the, uh, the e-stick in-mode technology, you can take this clip, you can pause it, and then line, move this back and forth to find in diastole, which would be right up here, right there, going by me. Stop it. And then from that point, go back and then trace your, your chamber or measure your dimension. Or you can measure the dimension off of the end mode and have precision because you've isolated exactly where that end systolic or end diastolic frame may be. You can do the same thing with the atrial chambers. And you can determine, again, end diastole and systole, the, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. So this 
ability to have this M mode from the stick acquisition, I believe, gives us much more precision in our analysis or our measurements of the chambers of the heart when we have to do that when we have disproportion, for example, or one, you know, whether it's the chambers of the outflow tracts. Now, here's something that's also very interesting. For, if you were to open up an car, adult cardiology textbook today and ask them about how do you evaluate the heart function, you know, they've gotten away from ejection fraction and, and cardiac output. They're really looking at things much more subtle, and one of them is called TAPS, T-A-P-S-E. It's called the tricuspid annulus plane systolic excursion. And what they simply do is this. Look at the, um, this is the apical view of the four-chamber view. This is the right ventricular wall. See this right here? That's the annulus moving upwards and downwards. You may not have thought about this, but you know when the right ventricle squeezes, it does several things. One is the walls move in towards the center, but also the base of the heart shortens and moves towards the apex, and this excursion is affected by certain disease states, hypoxia or overload or what have you. So what they've done in the adult world, they do it for both the right and the left ventricle, is they place the M-mode cursor over the area of the annulus, and they look at that excursion. Here's the corresponding M-mode. You can actually, I've uh, blown it up here, you can actually just do what's called a, uh, a slope analysis and pick the, the point which would represent the base at, in diastole, and here it is, the base in systole, and measure this distance. And there have been papers published that have plotted out with the stick M mode the corresponding uh, TAPSC uh, measurement. And so if, it, if, it's, if it's smaller than expected, that means the heart is dysfunctional. You can also do that same thing with the left ventricle very nicely. Now, that what's interesting, the left ventricle does not move from base to apex as much as the right ventricle does. The right ventricle is the one that does it more. But again, using stick technology with the e-stick, you get a higher resolution image. You can accomplish this task very easily. And irrespective of where you acquire it from, the image, whether it's parallel, spine up or it's going to be an apex up or apex at 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock, whatever, you just acquire the volume and rotate it on the screen and put your apex up and drop your M line and make your measurement, okay? So let's now look at some other modalities that we can use, multiplanar, TUI, OmniView, and render, okay? So here we are in the multiplanar view. Again, now I, what I've done here, I've done several things. I've placed the dot in the four-chamber view at the level of the interventricular septum. And so we're, cu we're cutting across now the... the uh, the short axis of the ventricles. Here's the main pulmonary artery. I've now picked up what's called the interventricular septum on FOSS, and you have a chance to see the, the wall in its entirety. Here we have the E-stick, again, a little bit higher resolution, but again, look at the, the B and the C planes. Here's a uh, nice traditional TUI in the A plane. We see high resolution uh, in this particular image. Here's the B plane, and again, this is, again, what impressed me the most, is the B plane data that we've acquired is almost looks as though I were doing a, a real A-plane acquisition, meaning that this is a reconstructed plane, okay? But it almost looks as good as if I had done it with a real-time 2D probe and turned the probe 90 degrees and acquired it uh, uh, natively. So again, you see the high resolution. This is a fetus at 38 weeks of, of gestation. See the disproportion up here? And you can see that, again... In fact, you can see kind of bowing of the interventricular septum here um, as the right heart here is, is larger than it should be. Anyway, but look at the quality of that acquisition in the B-plane. And we just turn the TUI on to see the boundaries a little bit more clearly if we choose to do that. And then uh, this is a TUI in the B-plane. Again, what I've simply done, here's what I've done in this TUI. I said, okay, let's play a game. Let's drop a line here across the valves here in the mid, mid uh, area of the atrial septum and the back of the, of the atrial septum. And guess what we observe? We observe the short axis view of the pulmonary artery. This is a quick and dirty way to look at the outflow tracks. Here we see the beginning of the aortic arch, and here we have the short axis view of the outflow tracks, the aorta and the pulmonary artery longitudinally on the side. Here we see it down here. So again, very nice, clearly depicted images. By simply dropping lines using TUI, boom, 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 we can see the outflow tracks very quickly. The same thing here, uh, again, in the C-plane. Again, I've dropped this now within the ventricular chamber, the interventricular septum, and the ventricular chamber. Here is, the, here is the, for the first time to see, somewhat clearly, the triangular shape of the right ventricle. Here's the left ventricle right here. It's more of a conical shape. Here we see the same thing down here 
with, with the uh, e-stick. So again, we're seeing things we weren't able to see before. This is really, I like this technique. You know, we heard Dr. Uh, Romero in the uh, uh, first day of the, uh, of the meeting discuss a very nice application. Dr. Alfred Al-Buhamid has a nice approach using, uh, again, uh, the volumes to look at the outflow tracks. And that's really the biggest problem that we have is the outflow tracks and seeing the arches and what have you. Here's something that's really simple. We all know how to find the three-vessel view. I mean, you should because you've heard about that for the last five or six or seven years. So you go to the level of the three-vessel view like I've got here. You take OmniView. You draw a line down the ductal arch, down the aortic transverse arch, the superior vena cava. What do you see? Aortic arch, ductal arch, superior inferior vena cava. I mean, that's simple. Find the three-vessel view. Use OmniView because you have high resolution now in the B and C planes. Drop your lines, one, two, three. That will have to take about 32 seconds. And there are the arches looking at you right there. Very quick, easy way to do that. Okay? And here we again, this is again, this is now using OmniView. I'm drawing lines parallel to the chambers. And notice again, here's the short axis view right here. Here's the length of the two-chamber view in the left ventricle. Here's a nice right ventricle. Let me show something that, that's really cool. Can you see this line right here? Let me help, tell me or help orient you. This is something that's really interesting that you kind of find. This is the tricuspid valve opening right here. The pulmonary valve is way over here. Now, this white line you see going the length of the chamber happens to be a, a marker. It's an anterior uh, uh, muscle that connects the tricuspid valve with the most uh, distal part of the right ventricle at its apex. And so when you're doing the four-chamber view screen, if you see this white band right here running the full length from the apex up to the valve, you know you're in the center of the right ventricular chamber. And you really couldn't see this before until you had this technology available. And this is what this represents. And so the right ventricular wall goes from here all the way out. And this is now we're getting the outflow track area. There's, the, there's where the pulmonary valve would be. So that's the right ventricular chamber and triangular shaped structure versus the left here. Again, not seen clearly before. Now, this is 4D uh, VCI. What I did here was I turned the VCI A on it, and you can set the distance at 20 millimeters. Look, we have a live here, a live uh, view. Uh, it looks like you've got depth here in the chamber of the heart, the four chamber, the five chamber view. I'm just kind of sweeping back and forth. Kind of a cool thing. And here's the inversion mode if those of you who still like inversion. And of course, we have the color. I gave this talk earlier this morning talking about the rendered color. This is a new technique that has not been available before, and it takes the, the boring uh, color Doppler uh, image that we see and turns it into a three-dimensional structure. It's almost like you've taken off the, open up the chest and see the heart beating in color. This is very, I think, intriguing. And, and even if you don't know what you're looking at, it's still beautiful. I mean, I showed it to my wife. She said, wow, that's really pretty. What is that? I said, that's a heart. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's got four chambers and outflow track and all this other stuff. Anyway, again, very, very nice. Here's, again, the glass body representation. We can do glass body or we can do monochrome. Depends on what you want to take and look at. And here's an example of a VSD. Here's, a, a four, here's the four chambers, or I'm sorry, the two ventricular chambers. And we see there's a septal, septal, septal separation, a normal heart. Here is the, the corresponding 2D, and the, there's a VSD there and a VSD there. And the same thing here, just uh, another VSD right here. This is uh, showing that. Here's the stenosis, stenosis of, the, of the pulmonary artery right here. We see a narrowing of the, of the neck of the pulmonary artery. You can see it also here. It kind of comes down and indents right there. You can kind of get a view of that, okay? So let's do some side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, again, just to, to kind of summarize, here's, here's a 4D and an E-stick. Again, very close in similarity, except we have a, a little bit lower frame rate here is because we set the, uh, it was a larger heart, larger fetus. Here we have now a comparison. This is one of my favorite slides to illustrate the point. Here's a live 2D image. This is what we see in this particular fetus in the 2D, in the four-chamber plane. That's your gold standard, okay? That's what you use. That's the best image that I can acquire using a live, real-time, 2D single plane on any transducer that you choose. Okay? Same fetus, same position. Here is the E-stick acquisition, and here is the corresponding VCI activated. What do you see? This, to me, looks very similar to this. Yet the benefit is, 
And this, I have a volume to play with, where this, I just have a simple 2D image. If we look at the real-time 4D, here's the native image. Here's the BCI image. Pretty close to this. So what I'm really saying to you is that I can have almost the same resolution that I would acquire with a 2D image with all the filters turned on. I can acquire with the e-stick and almost come close to that with a real-time 4D and have the volume to play with on top of it. Here's again the color doppler. As I mentioned, the color doppler here, the frame rate is a little bit lower, so I don't know that I would use this uh, diagnostically. But here's the color doppler from an e-stick. I mean, it's really exquisite. You see all the details uh, and, and where the color's going, and there's no, there's no splashing over the sides. There's no areas that you have poor color resolution. It really does a great job. Now, here's the, re here's the, re the um, again, the rendered. This is a low frame rate. See, I was just kind of jumping around. That's why I wouldn't use that with a real-time 4D, but certainly with the e-stick, we would do that. And the same thing right here. Okay, so my conclusions from this technology are as follows. If we look at real-time 4D and e-stick, they are complementary depending on what you want to do. Um, the bottom line is number, the technology removes movement artifact all the time from 4D, real-time 4D, and most time from e-stick. It enhances the image resolution, especially in the B and C planes. And I call it 4D volume imaging on steroids. I mean, it really makes a difference. And what we have found, I think this slide is here. Yeah, this one I showed yesterday in the lunch symposium. How many of you believe this principle? Time is money. Now, what, is it, what do we mean by that? If it takes me more time or longer time to see a patient, I either spend longer hours in the office to finish the day, right? Or if you're, someone says, well, the more patients you see, you, you get to pay your overhead down more, more quickly. You say, well, if I can accomplish the task and see more patients than I saw if I had spent longer time, then you'll generate more revenue to take and pay the bills. Or you can take and simply save time and go home earlier. Depends what you want to do. But the point is, whenever I talk to any company that presents to us technology to use, whether it's ultrasound or other things, I always say to them, one of the first things I say, if you're going to make a difference, you know, all these things you talk about are important. But for me as the clinician who has to do this on a daily basis, you save me time, you make me money, or you, you save me time, and I spend less time doing what I have to do to accomplish the task, Okay. That's really an important consideration as you balance the, the spreadsheet and say, what do I get for what I give as far as looking at technology is concerned? Now, we have maybe about um, five or eight minutes when we're supposed to be out. I, I don't know if anybody's coming in here afterwards. Let me open up a volume and kind of show you something, if you don't mind, for just a moment. I think I can do that. Let's see. Okay. Let's see what I can do here. I'm going to open up. Uh, let's do this. I'm going to open up first a 4D volume for you, okay? Here's a 4D volume. And we'll start the auto sending here. Uh, I hate Windows 8. Okay, there we are. Is that up on the screen there? Okay. I'll make this bigger. This is, 4, this is 4D view. And it's um, I'm using parallels on the Mac, so... So for the moment, the version I have, it seems to work. Let's do auto sending here. Okay. Go away. Bill Gates and his wonders. Okay, here we are. Now, what I've done here, let's go back to the original, um, original right here. Here's what the original looked like. Um, we're going to take and make this a little bit smaller. Come on. Now, when you hit the corner over the, this, this Windows 8 does that through you and drives me nuts. Okay. Oops, that's not what I want to magnify. Okay, so you get a sense of, of the image. Now, we make it larger. Again, now what you see here, and I think it's really important, is you can see, again, the resolution. I'm going to move this dot here, <clears throat> like so. And you can see the chambers down below. <clears throat> and if you wanted to take a look at the outflow tracks, you'd come up here. I mean, you just look at the clarity. Let's do this. Here's the, what we call the spin technique. We do this. That's with the VCI turned on. If we turn the VCI off, you can get your grayscale. You, of course, can have different, different image settings as far as your quality. 
Now you have the Omni view. Let's take and do this Omni view here quickly. So if I do this, let's go up here. I'm going to do. Okay, here's kind of a three vessel view right here. Okay, like so. Turn the VCI on. And do Omni view. And I'm going to take and just take and choose. Uh, let's do line one. Just see what happens here. Let's go draw a line. Like this, down here. Now we've got some shadows here. It, let's do this. Let me go over to the other one and do that to the east stick. Here's an east stick. Uh, start here. Auto semi. Hey, let me just do this. Let me show you this. This is. I'm going to do this. Let me show you this other thing first. Um, do the stick in mode, and let me go out of here first. What I want to do is turn the heart this way, okay? And our left side is here, and let's take and adjust this. I go. Here's the seaplane. Let's do this. Okay, now what I'm going to do is try to line this up. Okay, so I'll we'll drop my M mode cursor here. This is where I talk about the taps, if T-A-P-S-E, if we're looking at the uh, motion of the annulus. <clears throat> so we can then stop it. Now, this is the motion of the annulus. This is the, this is the base, and here's where, where it moves it in systole. So you simply would go to your measurement package right here. And get off of this. And we would um, do the M mode and the slope. I would simply just draw a line from here to here. That would then give me my distance, which I would measure, would measure. And you would compare this to, to some literature, literature that has uh, normal values. But that's how easy that is to do. And again, that's a very quick and dirty way to look at uh, ventricular wall function, especially of the right, of the right ventricle. Um, so, in conclusion, I think this technology for me as a fetal echocardiographer uh, is, gonna, is a game changer. And uh, there's lots of things that I haven't told you about that we can do because it's a for another, maybe for next year. But having the ability to take and have simultaneously record the A, B, and C planes, if you wanted to do cardiovascular analysis and see how, what function is, it gives us a whole new paradigm, I think to look into this area and to be more exact in our diagnosis and see more complex uh, heart defects and try to dissect out what's going on. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate it very much.